Last time we took a look at the Carolingian rise to power as a whole, really looking at Charles Martel, uh, talking a little bit about Pepin and Charles the Great, or uh, the focus of today as well. Um, today we're really just going to look at this one guy, uh, Charles the Great, who has an incredible, incredible impact on Europe of the Middle Ages. Um, he is the most influential, the most famous leader of this time, and really for hundreds of years afterwards is going to impact what's going on in Europe. So today our focus is really looking at Charles the Great, uh, and as you'll see, we're sticking with him for a while. Now, Charles's reign begins following the death of his father, Pepin the Short, in uh, 768 CE. Now, with the death of Pepin, Charles becomes King of the Franks, but as we mentioned last time, he's going to share this title with his brother, Carloman. But he only has to share it for a few years. 771, Carloman dies. As we kind of discussed, there's kind of a controversy around how he might have died and questions over whether or not Charles was involved. Um, but one way or another, Charles is a sole ruler of the Frankish Empire in 771. And he's going to maintain his sole rulership of this empire for a long time. Until 814, Charles is going to be in charge. So he is the king of the Franks. Now, Charles does not begin his reign as Charles the Great, right? He's just one of two kings, and, you know, after Carloman goes away, he's the only king, but that doesn't make you great. He does get this title, though. He does become Charles the Great by being pretty much the standalone greatest king of the Dark Ages. When we talk about the Dark Ages, a lot of people just, maybe they inch forward with society, but they don't make great leaps forward like uh, Charlemagne is going to. And that is what he becomes known as in history because of his accomplishments. He becomes known as Charles the Great, but we call him by his Latinized version of this, Charlemagne. Charlemagne just means Charles the Great, but using the Latin language, Charlemagne. For, for some reason, we do this for Charles, but we don't do this for some other uh, rulers of the time who might have you know, such and such the Great after their name. Um, he's famous for a number of reasons, more than we could hope to get into in a middle school course, uh, but it is important that we touch on a few of those. Most famous of which is not going to be his military conquest, for which he has many. Uh, it's going to be for his expanding of the Carolingian Renaissance. He does this primarily, although certainly not solely, through a partnership with the church. Uh, Charlemagne is going to take a lot of actions early in his reign that really is benefiting the Christian church. Um, he does this, firstly, uh, by invading Spain. Spain is still controlled by a Muslim empire, and um, it's still seen as a potential threat to Christianity in Europe. So all these different Christian nations and the Pope in Rome are all very concerned about Muslim control of Spain. Now, Charlemagne is not going to be successful in his invasion of Spain. He does not kick out this Muslim empire that is going to be there for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, but he is able to kind of draw a firm line. And Europe is not going to feel incredibly threatened by uh, the Spanish Muslims for quite a while, and never really seriously threatened again. Um, it really kind of shows um, the Muslim empire in Spain that they can't expand out of it anymore. Although Charlemagne is not successful at defeating them. Where he is successful is in taking out Lombardy. Uh, Lombardy, if you look at this map down here, is this red area just 
outside of the blue area. The blue area is kind of the Frankish territory when Charlemagne takes over. Um, as you can see, sizable country, um, about the size of modern France, a little bit larger. He's going to defeat the Lombards when the Lombards start to threaten the Pope in Rome. And he's going to take over that kingdom afterward. Now, interestingly here, the Pope had asked for Charlemagne's help because Lombardy had taken some papal lands, and the Pope wanted those lands back. And Lombardy is thinking, hey, why don't we just take all the land? So they're really pushing against the Pope. The Pope's pushing back, but he's kind of weak. He needs Frankish help. The Franks come in. They defeat the Lombards. They take over the Lombard kingdom. And the Pope says, great, wonderful, thank you very much. Now, about those lands that they control that we wanted back. Eh, no, Charlemagne's going to keep those lands. He's not going to threaten the Pope. Not for a while. And never really threaten. Um, they're going to get along more or less for a while. But uh, Charlemagne is keeping those lands. More in the Carolingian Renaissance uh, is his focus on education. Um, he really was a believer in the importance of education. And he demanded that those who worked in government be educated. And that those who worked in the church be educated. Now this was a time where literacy was a rare, rare thing. Very few people were literate. But he wanted at least the people who were officials in the government and officials in the church to know how to read and write. At a minimum, to know how to read and write. So that they can communicate with each other effectively, so that they are not losing knowledge. You know, if you ever play the game Telephone, where one person tells a story, and then another person tells a story, and another person tells a story, and the person at the end of the chain is not hearing the same thing, that doesn't work very well. So he wants to expand the number of literate people who can write, uh, can write as well. And in his effort to do this, he encourages scholars from across Europe to come to uh, his kingdom and to learn with each other and to study with each other. And he succeeds in getting um, Elkuin and a few other, the top scholars of Europe, uh, to come and stay with him. And during this time, uh, society as a whole is really benefiting. You get all these learned people together, all these smart people together, coming up with good ideas, and those ideas start to spread. And a big part of why the Frankish Empire is so successful during Charlemagne's reign is that they're so much smarter than everybody else, and they're making the right decisions. Now, this knowledge and the storing of knowledge and the transference of knowledge is really important. For this, Charlemagne really saw a partnership with monasteries. Um, the education of monks is going to serve a dual purpose here. It helps to spread Christianity, which is good. It's good for everybody, keeps the Pope happy, keeps all the other Christian kingdoms happy, um, builds potential allies spread Christianity into other countries, you got Christians there, maybe they'll tend to side with you instead of their pagans, uh, pagan rulers or Islamic rulers, could potentially work out. Um, but beyond that, monks are also recording secular knowledge and histories, which are going to be important for making sure society is not repeating the mistakes of the past, learning from those. And Frankish monks really become experts at this time some of the best in the world at learning these lessons, recording these lessons, passing these lessons on. So this was a very quick overview of some of his influence in uh, you know, non-military matters. Um, protecting the church, keeping the church safe, educating the church and government officials, helping the spread of knowledge. And uh, this is just one of many reasons why in 800 AD, um, Pope Leo is going to crown Charlemagne as Emperor of the Western Roman Empire now. You might be thinking, it's kind of funny to call him the Emperor of the Western Roman Empire when Western Roman Empire is kind of gone. Kind of gone largely because of the Franks. I mean, the Franks were one of those barbarian groups that came in and, and defeated this empire, shattered this empire. Well, the idea of the empire is still there. And the popes want to bring that idea back. 
And they feel by having once again an emperor in charge and an emperor who was crowned by the Pope, that is the Pope, the Christian church is giving this authority away, kind of signifies that maybe they're a higher authority. Um, if they can make Charlemagne an emperor and bring back that power and maybe control that power a little bit, then it's good for Charlemagne, it's good for the Christian church, and um, he does in fact bring back this idea of a Western Roman emperor. Uh, that idea is going to change a little bit, especially as we get into the Crusades um, and out of the Crusades, but we're going to have this title around a little bit, um, this emperor of the Western Roman Empire. The Western Roman Empire is gone. It's done. This is something new, something different. But we're going to use that title again for a little bit here and there. That's kind of it for today. Um, make sure that you take your entry ticket, and I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Next time we're going to look a little bit more at the relationship with the kings and popes.